Very good morning, everybody. It's uh, really an honor to be here to address all of you this morning. Um, this is an issue which I think is very timely uh, for all of us. Um, for Malaysia, of course, for uh, our security uh, sector, our security armed forces, but also actually for the region. Um, and beyond that, globally, it has a real significance in the way uh, issues um, such as displacement, uh, genocide, migration, irregular migration uh, at sea, in the context of COVID-19, how do we deal with uh, you know, a crisis of um, displacement, how do we deal with refugees, migrants. It's, it's a really um, important uh, issue which I think highlights a lot of the challenges that um, uh, we are facing as a global community today. Um, so first of all, um, to really say a great appreciation to Midas for um, initiating this dialogue and for choosing this topic. Um, and it's really an honor to have so many of you um, uh, dignified uh, uh, colleagues here. Uh, Rear Admiral Roslan bin Muhammad Yusuf, uh, Yunus, Professor Madia, Dr. Norayhan Zakaria, Dr. Jessica Ong Hai Liu, ACP Lam Yok Choi, Brigadier General uh, Aziz, and uh, all of you who are present today. I'd like to start by uh, perhaps just stating the problem that we're trying to address. And I think the, the problem also has to be seen in, in a few different contexts. I think the most immediate one, of course, which is very relevant uh, to all of you, is uh, there is obviously a problem when irregular migration happens, whether it's, I mean, we don't know yet, of course, when we see uh, migration, which is uh, not uh, legal, shall we say, we don't yet know what the status of uh, this population is, and, and we don't even know who they are actually. So if we have a boat that's coming towards our waters, towards our borders, we actually don't have the means yet to identify who is on that boat. So it's a border security issue, and that's obviously um, one of the first issues which is very relevant uh, to our security sector, to the Coast Guard, the Navy, uh, the Armed Forces, the Air Force, all of um, uh, our entire uh, nation's defense force. Um, but then, of course, we have the other side, which we're talking about um, here today as well, which is the human security issue, which is the well-being of the people and the passengers who are on uh, the vessel or, you know, this uh, ship. And that's another perspective which we also need to take into account. Um, it's not necessarily the role of the defense forces to conduct identification of who is on a vessel. But there are ways, of course, of engaging the right agencies um, to be able to conduct that uh, assessment. Of course, then there's the whole issue of our foreign policy and our defense policy, uh, which is, do we receive people or do we not receive people? And so this is a big question, um, which has you know, a lot of serious uh, implications. Um, of course, if you talk to uh, you know, the United Nations, um, they have a particular framework which they use. And uh, I'll explain more about that framework um, throughout the lecture. But of course, I think with um, a sovereign country, you know, we are uh, a sovereign country, but we're also one, obviously, that has a role in uh, our region within our ASEAN family, um, and also a role internationally. So we need to balance our priorities and our obligations as well. What the national priorities are, and our own defense policy with um, commitments that we might have made at the regional and international level, and our relationship with uh, bodies like the United Nations, um, which have, of course, particular guidelines and policies about how um, certain situations are, are dealt with. So now let's get down to the kind of state of the problem that we're talking about. as. Um, uh, as our director um, mentioned, they, there have been a number of boats that have approached Malaysia during this uh, the last over the last few months. When, of course, Malaysia and other countries across the world are facing um, a very serious pandemic, so this it, itself is quite an unprecedented situation. 
Of course, it's not the first time that the uh, Rohingya situation has been um, affecting us. This has been going on for many years. But it is the first time that we find ourselves in a situation where we have uh, irregular migrants, refugees, you know, most of them likely to be Rohingya, approaching our shores at the time of a pandemic when um, our main concern is the well-being of uh, our citizens and everybody who uh, lives in Malaysia and being able to manage, um, you know, our own uh, public health. So that is, a, is another big um, issue. The first boat uh, that landed um, was actually in early March, and it wasn't publicized very much. That was a boat of 252 uh, persons. Uh, it was in Nankawi. Um, and in fact, uh, our policy was to facilitate the disembarkation. So we weren't yet at this point where we were starting to, uh, where we took a very strong policy of, you know, let's not take any more boats or let's, um, you know, provide assistance and then uh, and then facilitate the boat to go back uh, to the sea. At that time, we facilitated disembarkation. And that was the boat of uh, 252 people. And it was right before uh, our Prime Minister announced our measures um, to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. So it was right before the MCO, a few weeks before the MCO. Uh, began. Then we had the second boat, which was during the start of the MCO. It was in April, and that was um, the boat of 202 uh, passengers who landed and again were facilitated, but there was more reluctance already on our part because of the COVID situation. Um, then, in fact, we had a landing not here in Malaysia. We had another disembarkation that took place in Bangladesh which was also a very tense situation because it was um, boats that had been uh, basically not allowed to disembark, and not just by us, but also by Thailand. Thailand has also been um, you know, quite strict now in terms of not allowing for disembarkation uh, of such boats. So there were boats that were pushed back, and um, the landing was also very difficult in Bangladesh because Bangladesh's um, position is also that they are hosting refugees not on a legal basis. They do host over a million uh, Rohingya refugees, but in Bangladesh, Bangladesh is, is like us, not signatory to uh, the Refugee Convention. So Bangladesh's hosting of refugees is actually like ours. Ours, it's based on humanitarian grounds. It's at the, um, the goodwill of the government and the good faith of the government to provide uh, temporary humanitarian um, uh, it's, it's not really a legal uh, right. It's not a legal obligation of the state of Bangladesh, or in our case as well. It's really based on um, the government's understanding that there are humanitarian situations and the goodwill of extending um, uh, the ability or the temporary, uh, I wouldn't say right, but basically the temporary permission to reside and stay in the country for a period of time. But because it's not based on a legal framework, on our policy, domestic policy, or um, the ascension to a, an international uh, convention, that can also be taken away at the discretion of the government. So Bangladesh is actually in the same position. Bangladesh uh, also basically takes the view that they are hosting uh, over a million refugees based on um, compassion based on uh, their uh, understanding that the situation across the border, which is in Bakayan State in Myanmar, is uh, deteriorating. And they um, have also expressed you know, very strong solidarity with um, the Rohingya as victims of genocide. So based on that, they have been hosting. But when the boat leaves and the boat tries to come back, in fact, they were very reluctant to take the boat back. Um, what they did eventually was to negotiate for permission to re-enter, but only if that boat, the people on that boat, would be taken to um, Bajan Shah, which, <coughs> excuse me, for um, those of you who have been following the uh, developments in Bangladesh, Bajan Shah is an island which uh, Bangladesh basically designated for the relocation of Rohingya refugees because the camps in Cox's Bazaar and uh, Teknaf are so overcrowded that it's actually very, um, it's not, you know, the conditions are, are very dire from a humanitarian perspective, 
but also the security situation is quite uh, fragile as well. And the ability for um, the Bangladesh uh, government to also control that situation is quite limited because you really have a massive population um, <laughs> in those camps. And um, Bangladesh feels that by moving uh, at least a portion of the refugees who are living in the camps in Cox's Bazaar and in Technoff, they would be able to better control the situation in Cox's Bazaar as well as manage um, the population in uh, Bashan Shah in a much more controlled way. But there has been controversy over the decision about Bashan Shah because um, there hasn't been, uh, at least from the United Nations perspective, there hasn't been sufficient technical assessments about the uh, feasibility of uh, the living conditions in uh, Bashan Shah, not just in terms of infrastructure, but in terms of livelihood. So in terms of sustainability, in terms of looking at um, the uh, remote location of uh, the island, and also, quite importantly, also their um, vulnerability to natural disasters. So that's one um, area where basically uh, the United Nations has been trying hard to persuade the Bangladesh government to, to um, allow them to do uh, more technical assessments on these issues. So disaster um, vulnerability, it's a really important one because uh, the entire area of the Bay of Bengal, including Cox's Bazaar, but um, also this uh, island of Bashan Shah, is very prone to cyclones. Um, and every year you will have cyclone season, and uh, there was a fear that there wouldn't be sufficient preparedness for disasters uh, in, the, in that area. So there are some legitimate concerns, uh, but at the same time, you know, there's a reason why the Bangladesh government also has proposed um, this as a, as a solution to uh, the overcrowding of the camps. Um, so that was the, uh, that was the third boat. Then, of course, we had the, most, the more recent arrival of um, the latest boat in, in Langkawi, and that was a boat of uh, 269 persons. They're still in Langkawi. Um, that, uh, again, I think this was really at the height of um, you know, our own uh, policy shift that started, uh, has started to emerge, um, and expressions by uh, uh, our Prime Minister and, of course, uh, our Honourable Defence Minister that we in fact, cannot keep receiving uh, Rohingya refugees. So this has been part of um, the policy now. Uh, then, of course, we had the latest boat that arrived in the region, which was in, uh, in Aceh, in Indonesia. And that was a group of 99 people, just arrived um, a few days ago, in fact, on the 24th of June. So where do all these people come from? And how does this, you know, these boats work? You know, if you listen to the stories that the refugees tell, uh, tell journalists or tell, uh, you know, probably UNHCR. Most of them will say that the boat that they arrived on is the same boat that they left on. That's actually not the case. That's not the way the smuggling works. You don't get onto a boat in uh, Bangladesh or Rakhine, and then, you know, you take the same boat for the entire journey. That's not the way it works. It's actually quite uh, organized. Um, there is a very... Uh, Unfortunately, an, an increasingly strong um, network, again, that's emerging now, of, I would say, smugglers first. It's not trafficking yet, but the, the difficulty in the situation uh, for the Rohingya refugees in particular is that it's actually both. It starts off as smuggling, and then on the journey, it turns into trafficking. And this is because I think we all understand the important difference, right, between smuggling um, and trafficking. It's complex in the Rohingya situation because the Rohingya actually want to leave. They don't, uh, you know, it's not a situation where people are being forced to get onto these boats. It's a situation where people are willingly getting onto the boats because, for many reasons, but because they feel they have uh, no feasible option of survival in the place that they're in. Um, they fear... Uh, either persecution in the area that they're in, so if they're leaving Myanmar directly, it's direct persecution that they're afraid of. Currently, the ones in Bangladesh, they also have many fears. I'll get it more into more detail about that later. Um, and partly it's the fear of ret being returned to Bangladesh. That's, I'm sorry, to Myanmar. That's one of the big fears um, that the refugees in Bangladesh have now. Um, but that's uh, for the next part of the discussion. I wanted to discuss, you know, really this, this network of smugglers um, 
and traffickers and the, the way these boats work. So basically you have um, families. There's a very high demand. So I think the first thing we need to remember is the smuggling network will never survive if there's no demand. And this is something, you know, which has been well-researched for, uh, you know, people who specialize in smuggling. There's a strong message that they have, which is, you know, the, the most effective way. Of course, you, you have many levels of uh, cooperation, um, you know, surveillance uh, and dismantling of networks that are needed. But you actually need to also really work at the root causes of smuggling, and that is... You know, there are certain populations. If it's smuggling, it means that people are voluntarily leaving. Why are they voluntarily leaving? And especially if we're not talking about, um, you know, just migrants. It's not just economic migrants who want to come to a place for improvement of uh, their economic situation. It's a much more complex situation. Um, motives for a group like the Rohingya, of course, are mixed. They, Of course, they do want a better economic situation, but that it's not because they want a better job, so to speak. It's because they have no livelihood mm -hmm. at all. In, in Rakhine State, they are actually denied the right to a uh, decent livelihood. They're denied the right to work. And in Bangladesh, they're also denied the right to work because of um, this, their status as uh, refugees not being you know, legally um, recognized as well. So people willingly getting on to boats for several reasons. One of the biggest reasons for um, Rohingya uh, to basically come to Malaysia, of course, is uh, you know the fear of uh, persecution in Myanmar. Number two, there's also already, uh, because there's a, a decent-sized community of uh, Rohingya here, very often people are coming to join family members. So a lot of the Rohingya you see on the boats, mm -hmm. They have family members here already, whether it's um, a brother or uh, a cousin or somebody distant, or in many cases, if you see women on the boat, usually they have a husband or um, somebody who has basically already been engaged to them as a husband. So there is this pattern as well of women being brought from Rakhine State and from Bangladesh to married Rohingya men who are here. And that's one of the biggest um, reasons why uh, Rohingya are coming. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that they're only coming for those reasons and that there's no fear of persecution. That is also happening. If there wasn't fear of persecution, they wouldn't be leaving. Uh, especially because the Rohingya are a community which really just, you know, they don't need a lot to survive because they've been given so little. Um, you know, in the context of Rakhine State, they actually have learned survival skills and they know how to survive with extremely little. Um, the, you know, in Rakhine State, of course, they are denied uh, basic um, access to healthcare, they're denied education, they're denied access to livelihoods. Um, and their food insecurity situation, you know, is, is very dire as well. Um, but in that context, even in the Bangladesh camp, you know, we've, uh, of course, uh, we've had the Malaysian field hospital there, so Malaysia's very aware of the situation um, in Cox's Bazaar. Um, but even there, if I think those of us who've been to the Cox Bazaar uh, camp, we can see how basic it is. But at the same time, you know, it's the Rohingya know how to survive with that type of situation. So the argument that um, you know people are leaving because of the camps itself, I think needs it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. I think what we need to see is why are there so many people from Bangladesh now coming. One of the main reasons is not in Bangladesh. It's because of the situation in Myanmar, that that situation is deteriorating even more. So if we look at the situation in, in uh, Rakhine State right now, the uh, main problem in Rakhine State is not the issue of the Rohingya. It's the issue of the Arakan army and the Tatmadaw. And there's um, an internal uh, civil conflict that's taking uh, place in uh, Rakhine State. And that's the biggest problem, and it's the biggest uh, deterrence right now to, for Rohingya who want to go back to, Bangla uh, to uh, Myanmar from Bangladesh, actually. Um, and many of them do want to go back. Most of them want to go back. Um, it's the biggest deterrence for them to go back because the security situation is just deteriorating rapidly. And that's really been happening, um, I would say, just in the last couple of years. So if we have um, that view, and 
this is a view I think that not many people, um, certainly in, in our country, but I think across the region, are not very aware of because there's been so little analysis and so little information because it's an ongoing life conflict that's taking place um, right now. So this is the main reason why uh, Rohingya are getting onto these boats. Um, it's, you know, these several reasons. What happens? How do they pay for the journey? So I think there's been a lot of debate about, you know, well, if Rohingya are so poor, how do they pay? You know, then, you know, we uh, have seen figures in the newspapers, you know, 2,800, sometimes 3,000, um, you know, that people are paying per head to take this journey. So how are they paying for this? Um, in fact, they, they actually go into debt. So the pattern that Rohingya use is they don't always pay immediately. Very often, they pay the they pay off the um, they pay off the uh, over, over time basically through indentured labor, or they will promise the smuggler that they will pay you know within a year. And once their idea is that once they get here, they start finding you know a job, and they save up and they start paying in, in, in installments. And that's happened uh, you know for years. This has been one of the patterns that the Rohingya use. So. It shouldn't surprise us that there are so many people coming. It's not because they have the capital to pay up front. They don't pay up front. They actually pay um, either when somebody is about to land or much, 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 much later. So this is the um, system that they've, uh, you know, um, basically um, been able to create between the smugglers and uh, Rohingya because a lot of the smugglers also realize that Rohingya can't pay immediately, but there's a desperation to leave. Um, and therefore, it, it becomes still quite profitable for, um, for the smugglers. When does this turn to trafficking? So it turns to trafficking, of course, when um, the violence takes place, when exploitation takes place, and that happens regularly on these boats. So very likely on all of these boats, there is uh, abuse that takes place. There's um, Deprivation of uh, obviously, you know, the conditions, the food um, is extremely minimal. People are kept really just barely kept alive. Um, there's violence that takes place uh, regularly towards uh, women and children on the boat, but also towards men. If there's an argument that takes place between, um, you know, the broker and one of the men, very often um, there's physical violence. There have been instances where um, the Rohingya refugees have been killed and thrown overboard. Um, when somebody dies of ill health, they also just get thrown overboard. So there's all forms of exploitation that take place um, on these boats as well. So that, that's why it's a very uh, difficult uh, situation. And who are these traffickers? Who are these smugglers and traffickers? And I think, um, I'm sure that our government has also done a lot of intelligence and research into this, but it's a mixed group. So it's not one country that's responsible for it. This is a really a transnational um, network, which involves everybody from Bangladeshis to Burmese, Myanmarese, to uh, some Malaysians as well, unfortunately, um, to Rohingya themselves. That's a really important thing to remember. There are Rohingya, and usually on those boats, you will find at least one broker, one agent who's accompanying the boat. So usually the one who is the one, you know, who's the agent. So you can always tell. There will always be one who speaks Malay. And that is uh, the person who is obviously part of the network. Probably not the big fish. They are not the ones who designed the whole system, but they are part of that system. Um, and then, of course, Thailand is also uh, involved. So it is, um, it's a very complex network. But I have to say, I think that um, it's something which is not impossible to, if not dismantle, at least to curb. Because we've done it before in the region. I think this is one thing we really have to remember. That uh, in the response to the 2015 crisis, if we all remember, that the Andaman Sea crisis in 2015 uh, was, in fact, in some ways, even worse than this one. In terms of the numbers, we really had, at that time, um, thousands at sea. And it was a very similar crisis to this. You know, there were boats that couldn't land. Um, but the difference there was that if you all remember, there was the discovery of the mass graves on the border of Wankalian, the mass graves. And because of that, all the governments in the region, our government, Thai government, Bangladesh government, all cracked down on the smuggling and trafficking and really put 
extremely strict um, punishments towards uh, those who were caught to be responsible, no matter who they were, regardless of who they were. And that's an extremely important step to take. So I think that our response to this has to be very comprehensive. We need to have, um, to really demonstrate, and perhaps that is uh, one of the concerns that should take, to, to take precedent. Um, I think we need to highlight the fact that we absolutely do not tolerate uh, the illegal trafficking in, in persons, um, and that we realize that there have been abuses that take place on this boat, so that there is trafficking that's taking place, of children and women as well. Um, this is also something that's very relevant for us in the ASEAN framework. You know, ASEAN doesn't have a lot of um, legally binding mechanisms, but one of the most important recent legally binding conventions is our Convention on the Trafficking in Persons, um, ACTIP. And that's a really important uh, legal framework that we as an ASEAN country and the entire region as uh, an ASEAN region should be activating and really working together on. So that's extremely important. Um, how many people are still at sea? For this particular case, uh, there are actually at least four to five hundred people still at sea. Um, and where are they? You know, as I mentioned, they are not on the same boat that they're going to be arriving on. They are basically um, so when boats leave from Bangladesh or from Myanmar, they will leave in small feeder boats, and the small feeder boats will come from many different parts of uh, you know these areas. Um, these recent boats have been mainly from Bangladesh, but very regularly it's a mixed group where you have um, a few boats from Rakhine that are coming directly from Sitwe, uh, usually Sitwe because Mongdo situation has been extremely bad. So it's mainly from Sitwe, and then um, Cox's Bazaar, Teknaf, and then they will join together in the Bay of Bengal onto a larger boat. So they will basically bergabung into one big trawler, and then the trawler is the one that moves across from the Bay of Bengal to the Andaman Sea. And it waits in the international waters, and they start you know, trying to monitor what's the best time for disembarkation. And then they will um, send out the smaller boats. So the boats that you see arriving are small boats for disembarkation, basically. Um, and it, it, I mean, it's true when the Rohingya refugees tell you the conditions have been terrible, because on the boats, on all these boats, the conditions are terrible. They are. Um, you can imagine a trawler is quite large, but if you have 2,000 people on that trawler, or you know, 1,000 plus people, the conditions are cramped, people are really um, you know, living in extremely dire conditions. So I think what we need to remember is that the Rohingya are the victims here. Right? I think this is really important to remember. So people are profiting off their misery. There is a, a very real persecution of the Rohingya in Rakhine State, and a very real fear that um, Rohingya refugees have to returning to Myanmar. And I think what's important to remember about um, the Rohingya, especially the group in Bangladesh, they all want to go back. You know, if they had the choice to go back tomorrow, they would go back, especially the group that just came across the border. That group, um, well, just, you know, a few years ago, over the last few years, um, the one that was really facing uh, the massive violence. For um, every uh, interview that I've had, that other organizations have had with uh, Rohingya, including uh, you know, our former ministers when they went to visit uh, Cox's Bazaar, the Rohingya there will tell you directly. They've even told Myanmar directly in negotiations um, and dialogues that they've had with uh, the Myanmar Foreign Ministry. They want to go home. There's a, there's a lot of people who actually want to stay in Bangladesh. And, you know, Malaysia, it, it's a destination if they have no other choice. It's not a destination of choice for them in the sense that they want to be here rather than Myanmar. No, they want to go back to Myanmar. So that's very important to remember. Um, so what then should the priority be? I think we need to try to shift the focus a little bit for Malaysia. Of course, you know, there's the border front line. And even the approach that we take on the border front line, I think it's very important that we combine that with a more comprehensive approach to this problem which, number one, has to address, and I think that we've started to do that, in fact, uh, our uh, Honourable Prime Minister has mentioned, in fact, in the ASEAN summit recently. I mean, there were two things. One was, we're not taking any more uh, Rohingya refugees. We can't take any more Rohingya refugees. But I think the, the very important statement that, was, um, that accompanied that was the fact that uh, we need to start addressing the root causes again of this, and Myanmar has to take responsibility. 
And that's extremely important. So I would say that that's the number one priority to push pressure back on Myanmar. And we have to do more within ASEAN about this. We have to be much stronger than we are currently being. Um, because ASEAN is engaged, I'll talk about that too, but ASEAN is not engaged in, in the most effective way right now. There's a lot more that ASEAN can do um, and, and uh, should be doing. So this issue um, I wanted to touch on as well, um, basically of definitions of refugees. So when you have a group that moves basically from one country to another, from one country of um, asylum, shall we say, to another country of asylum where people are seeking asylum, are they still refugees? Do we still consider them to be people deserving international protection? I think this is a big question which um, has been debated um, in uh, our circles. You know, we can see questions about uh, you know, the status currently of uh, Rohingya coming from Bangladesh rather than Myanmar. So how do we deal with this issue? Um, I think what we need to remember is under international law, there is in fact, uh, you know, international protection uh, is based on the persecution and the fear, the fear of persecution um, that a person face, faces in their, their original country. So for the Rohingya, it's about the persecution they face in Myanmar. When they go to Bangladesh, the question is, to what extent can Bangladesh grant them international protection? And I think here is where there's a slightly complicated question, because Bangladesh, on the one hand, is hosting them. You know, as I mentioned, it's very rare that you'll find any country in the world now willing to take, you know, one million refugees. And they've, they've done that. And it's, uh, you know, a country which is still um, struggling with its own development challenges, particularly in Cox's Bazaar, it's a very poor district. But nonetheless, they've taken a very large number. Um, however, because Bangladesh has not signed the Refugee Convention, there are also many aspects of what we would consider to be international protection which are not granted uh, to Rohingya in Bangladesh. Um, and you know that's for various reasons why the Bangladeshi government hasn't done that. And I think one is also to prevent them from staying for too long. They would like um, the Rohingya refugees to return to uh, Myanmar, and they want Myanmar to take responsibility for this population. So Bangladesh as well, they don't um, grant the right, for example, for um, education. Uh, including in the camps, there's a level of education, but it's not formal education. Uh, it's informal education. They um, don't grant the right to work as well. So the livelihoods of Rohingya in Bangladesh is very vulnerable also. Um, and most of them are still very dependent on aid. Um, thirdly, the protection situation, you know, just the general situation for uh, a Rohingya family living in the camps. You know, most of them have quite a lot of children, so you can imagine the conditions where you have, you know, little children running around a camp, you can't monitor them all the time, there are traffickers and smugglers and all kinds of, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, border crime as well on those areas, uh, you know, there's drug um, trade that's taking place along that border for a long time. Uh, you know, not by Rohingya, but by uh, existing networks there. So it's a very vulnerable situation. So the, the protection um, that the Rohingya enjoy in Bangladesh, I would say is not up to international standards. So therefore it's not um, surprising that they would also try to find protection elsewhere. So if we go by the book, right, and again, I'm glad this is Chatham House Rule because I think we should be very honest here. These are not easy questions and there's no easy answer, actually. There's really no easy answer. The, by the book, you know, if you ask UNHCR, for example, and uh, I understand that our defense minister will be meeting UNHCR uh, later today. I think it's important, you know, UNHCR has to take the position, of course, that the highest level of international protection at all times. That's their job, that's their role and their mandate. As, um, you know, a government, as a sovereign government, your governments need to make their own decisions about what's appropriate. But having said that, it's important to try to balance international standards um, certainly obligations, what are two uh, conventions we've signed, with our national priorities. So how do we deal with this in this particular situation? I think that we need to recognize that the Rohingya who are on these boats do deserve international protection. So um, whether or not we decide to receive them, 
should not be based on a, a kind of, um, how would I say it? it? It shouldn't be based on a analysis that, that says that Rohingya don't deserve international protection. But saying that they deserve international protection doesn't mean that the only solution is, you know, what UNHCR proposes, which is taking out everyone who comes, basically. So I think that it's important that we start to see the other options that we have. If we decide that for this period, maybe it's not a permanent decision, but for this particular period, Malaysia is unable to receive uh, any more refugees from uh, Rohingya refugees who are coming by boat. I mean, that's a fair decision for Malaysia to make. However, we can still do other things to complement that decision um, and try to meet uh, obligations of extending protection. But how do we do that? If we can't do it as uh, a sovereign nation, we do it through the regional mechanisms. There are regional mechanisms. We do it through trying to really maybe even play a leading role diplomatically in convening the regional discussions. Right? It doesn't have to be only through ASEAN. We can always bring together like-minded countries, even three countries, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. These are the three main countries in ASEAN region who will be affected by these boat movements. And it's been done before, because in 2015, when the boat crisis um, started, Malaysia did convene a meeting of these three countries uh, here in Kuala Lumpur, in Putrajaya, of Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, and our government, basically had a kind of tripartite meeting to discuss a solution. And then it was um, you know, decided that there will be uh, an acceptance of the boats that remained. Most of them were taken in by Indonesia. We took in uh, one. And then Thailand convened a big meeting, which was basically bringing uh, the Bali process um, uh, states together uh, with uh, dialogue partners you know, from the region to try to come to a situation, uh, to some resolutions about emphasizing the importance of dealing with the recourses. So taking that diplomatic approach together with um, a border security approach is, I think, really important. And this is something I would like to encourage um, Malaysia to start doing. So the language also should be um, enhanced and developed so that our language is not about only um, preventing people from coming. It's about reminding the entire region that there has to be responsibility sharing. And that is language which is already captured in the Global Compact on Refugees, which Malaysia has uh, acceded to, basically. It's not a formal agreement, but we basically um, uh, supported it, uh, the passing of the Global Compact. And the Global Compact is actually something which would benefit us, because it, it's not about taking on more obligations, it's about how you partner, how you partner with other countries, how you partner with other stakeholders. So it is definitely unfair for one government to be expected to take on uh, the, uh, I don't like to use the word burden, but to take on the responsibility of sheltering and caring for you know, a vast population where there is almost no end in sight to the root problem. But we can't do it alone, so we shouldn't do it alone. And I think that the government's position should be that this isn't a problem that is going to be solved by any one country. The root cause won't be solved by one country, and neither will the current humanitarian crisis. So we should, I think, try to think about how we frame this. We should use language saying, this is a humanitarian crisis and we recognize that. We take the position that we cannot take more Rohingya refugees for now. Um, we do urge, and we would like to maybe even take the lead in convening regional dialogues to ensure that there is um, a regional solution found. And what are the options? So, you know, most countries will say, well, we don't want them either. However, as we've seen just last week, there is one country, and in fact one province, uh, which is very willing to take them, which is Aceh. And that's a province I know well, because I spent the first part of my humanitarian career there. In fact, we've named our organization uh, Gatanyo, which means Kita. It means uh, Kita in Bahasa Aceh, because I have a long experience there. And it's a very interesting uh, place because it's a place that has experienced uh, conflict and disaster for many, many decades. Um, so the, uh, and also they have a very old adat. So their adat, uh, they have adat laud and adat pemulia uh, jame, which means pemulia kantamu. And their adat laud is uh, very strong and it, has, it gives an obligation for the 
fishermen, who they call the Bangli Malawut, to conduct rescue at sea. Uh, for any, any boat that's in distress, any, any creature that's in distress, actually, including, including an animal. So with this particular cultural and even political uh, uh, context uh, with Ache, they, in fact, I think would be willing to be a point of disembarkation. They, Indonesia may not be willing to take thousands and thousands, but at least for a point of temporary disembarkation, I feel that there's, um, it's worth pursuing the dialogue with Indonesia and particularly with uh, the government of Aceh about their willingness to become the disembarkation point for the region. But these are discussions that really need to be taken forward in a diplomatic setting. Um, and, but I think we can see, for all of us you know, who've been watching the situation for years, 2015, three boats were saved by Achenese fishermen. Uh, in uh, different parts of the Aceh coast. This time as well, the boat of 99 was saved by... I mean, the Achenese were fighting to bring the, the boat to shore. You know, they were actually standing on the shore, crying, you know, insisting to the local government that um, they bring the boat to shore. And the local government hadn't decided yet. So, you know, Jakarta and the Pemerintah uh, Daerah Aceh Utara were still negotiating, still trying to come to a decision. And the local people basically came to the shore and said, we won't accept if we don't bring them in. So eventually, the local government said, okay, you bring them in, you take responsibility. And they all agreed, okay, kita akan bertanggung jawab. So they started to give their own buras and all of these things. But it's that type of spirit. And that's, I think, something very positive for the region. It doesn't mean we all need to be like them. But it means that we have um, a potential of having uh, one place and one society that can play that role in the region. Malaysia has a role to play as well. We still have the biggest uh, population of Rohingya in the region, right? Uh, Indonesia doesn't have a big population, so which is another reason perhaps why they can take more temporarily. The focus of Malaysia now, uh, given that we do not wish to receive more Rohingya refugees for the time being, I think that's also important to stress, uh, that this is something that we cannot do for now, we want to stress the regional solutions, we want to look at the root causes, but also we should really be focusing on managing our, uh, basically looking at our arrangements here in Malaysia for managing the Rohingya refugee uh, communities. And that's very important because as we've seen in the last few months, there has been a lot of concern and a lot of tension over the relationship between uh, and the perception um, you know, of uh, locals towards Rohingya refugees. There's been a lot of issues that have come to the fore, whether it's about um, you know, the Pasaporong, the uh, role in, of uh, refugees in the markets, or of Rohingya particularly um, in the markets, the um, issues of hygiene, issues of culture, issues of crime. There are all kinds of issues that are actually very uh, important to address. So our focus, should actually be on addressing those issues and thinking through how we can design a system uh, here in Malaysia that is balancing all of the concerns that we have. You know, certainly we do have uh, humanitarian concerns, but we also obviously have concerns about um, making sure that we have a, a continue to have a harmonious society um, at the community level. And how do we do that? There are ways of doing that, and in fact, there's a lot of evidence to show that the more policy you have, which regulates the way refugees are managed, the better things become. I'll give you an example. Number one, I mean, why, why is that? You know, if currently when Rohingya refugees come, uh, just say they arrive in Langkawi and then they go to Belantik for six months, and then eventually, you know, our immigration realizes, well, we, we can't deport Rohingya refugees, so UNHCR comes and releases them. So just say six months after landing, or a year even after landing, you have uh, Rohingya refugees coming out into Malaysian society. And then what happens? You know, we don't have any programs of education. I'm not talking about formal education. I'm talking about cultural education, language, right? They learn Bahasa Melayu quickly, but they don't learn it formally. So for most Rohingya that uh, I've met here, you have a conversation with them they know how to understand uh, Bahasa, Bahasa Pasa, you know. You ask them to isi borang, they already get very confused. And 
you start to talk to them in Bahasa Baku, you know, they get really confused. So this is priority. I mean, you know, we need a program where anyone who is coming into the country, uh, who we know is going to be here, first and foremost, learn the language. Secondly, learn the ada, learn the culture, learn the budaya, learn the cultural context. Understand what is acceptable in Malaysian society and what is not acceptable. So I think it is our responsibility to work, and this is where I think um, organizations like ours, NGOs, can help, because we would like to work with the government in, in doing, um, constructing these types of programs. You know, how do we do outreach? How do we, because we understand the mentality of the refugees as well, we also understand the concerns of Malaysians. It's important to be able to bring these two together and to be able to teach refugees first. Um, you're coming into this country, you are here at the uh, goodwill of the Malaysian government. If you would like to remain here without problems, these are the shara shara. These are the conditions. That's very important, right? So I think that we should not um, be expected to receive without conditions. But what are the what are those conditions? I think it, it's it's important to look at laws, but even more important than laws now, I think, to maintain um, a kind of a, you know a social cohesion at the social level. Um, for Gatania, we've been focusing a lot on work in Kuda. We've been going to, uh, not Langkawi actually, but in Alosta, Sungai Patani, um, and places like that, mainly to uh, facilitate, together with uh, our partner, Mapim, Mapim is a, a strong partner of ours, to basically help to facilitate dialogue at the, lo at the local level between um, you know, local communities, Bungulu and uh, Rohingya refugees, to build understanding. And I think mainly the most important thing that um, we feel uh, needs to be done is actually to listen to the locals first about what their grievances are, what their concerns are, and then try to explain to them, this is the situation of Rohingya, and then explain to the Rohingya, this is how people perceive you. This is the tingkalaku yang tidak akan diterima. You know, they need to learn. And I, we need to remember that Rohingya have had very little education. The women, zero education, for the most part. It is very rare that you find a Rohingya woman who has any literacy at all, not even Arabic to read the Quran. So at least with some men, they can you know, at least read uh, the Quran. But for most women, absolutely zero, absolutely zero. And this is a, an issue. And the, um, I think also the perception you know, that Rohingya refugees are not always ready to uh, integrate. It's not about that. It's really about their fear that when they come, it's not that they don't want to somehow uh, have a you know conversation and to be um, uh, to interact with uh, Malaysians, but very often they come here and they are so scared of even um, interacting with authorities because of their experience from Myanmar. So I think we, what we need to, to do is to mbimbi. Yeah, we really need to have this attitude of mbimbi. Then if they brought kasalahan then you can go after them with the law, because they should understand the law. So, arrival, um, you know, before releasing, maybe this is something to be discussed uh, with uh, colleagues at immigration, before you release anyone, have a cause for them. Malaysian law, uh, Bahasa, of course, language, Malaysian customs and culture, you know, all of these important things, it's really critical. Um, I would say it's, it's the same for other refugees as well, you know, they, um, other refugees obviously from you know, from Syria, from Afghanistan, and others. But those uh, other groups have had a higher level of education. So it's a little bit different, the context. It's a bit easier to manage. And also the groups are much smaller. Um, even the other groups from Myanmar, like the Chin and others, um, they've also had a higher level of education. The Rohingya have really had almost zero. So I would say that that is um, a few things that we need to focus on. Um, in terms of looking anyway, uh, you know, at the region. Um, I think that we do need to have a lot more diplomacy also in terms of military to military diplomacy. And this is something uh, which is mainly dealing with, uh, well, it's two things really. One is obviously for the regional situation, this, um, you know, crisis at sea situation, uh, the monitoring of uh, the movements, how to manage, um, you know, looking at if there's a disembarkation point, how do we actually try to alert there's a boat that's coming here, 
we're not going to receive them, but we alert if Indonesia is willing to take it to become the disembarkation point, alert them and ensure that there's a somehow the safest passage that's possible, right, within the limitations uh, that we all have. But then secondly, I think really this issue of uh, Rakhine State, the improving the situation in Rakhine State, and that also needs military to military diplomacy because unless the conflict ends, the Arakan army conflict with the, um, with, uh, the Myanmar military, unless that conflict ends, there will be no repatriation of Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh because it's just too insecure. So ASEAN has tried to push the issue of repatriation um, and has even uh, sent uh, assessment teams from the AHA Center uh, to help the Myanmar government improve the situation in Bangladesh, at least to assess, I'm sorry, in, in Rakhine State, to assess the situation. But none of those assessments will have any impact uh, under the current situation um, because we, we've literally seen Rakhine State um, go from being fairly stable, at least not for the Rohingya, obviously, but for the rest of the communities, for the Burmi, uh, the Buddhist uh, Rakhine and the other ethnic groups, there was a level of stability. We've seen that level of stability decline literally over the last three years. And it's declined extremely rapidly to the point where there's now um, a lot of displacement of civilians inside Rakhine State itself. There is, uh, in fact, Rakhine themselves are fleeing. So it's not only the Rohingya who are coming, um, you know, to uh, Malaysia and actually Rakhine go a lot to Thailand. They have passports, of course, so they don't take boats. They would come uh, maybe to Thailand from, uh, you know, with their passports. But they're fleeing as well because there's a huge uh, level of insecurity um, and a lot of a lot of fear of being uh, returned to Rakhine State right now. So unless. Uh, and unfortunately, Rakhine State, so Myanmar does have a peace process. It has a ceasefire uh, process for the many armed groups that they have in the country. R the Arakan army is not part of the ceasefire agreement. Um, and until today, uh, the Myanmar government has not yet agreed to negotiate with the Arakan army. Uh, although, uh, I was sharing uh, earlier uh, with Encik Nohisham and uh, with the uh, General that there is interest from some of the high-level diplomats in uh, Naypyidaw, um, who are very close to Do Aung San Suu Kyi, who are interested in trying to pursue a peace process. But for them, it's about the terms of autonomy, it's about the terms of, you know, what is it that Rakhine will accept. So those, there is some thinking about that. But I think that if uh, Malaysia, and Malaysia's played a role, you know, we play a role in Patani, we did a, an incredible job in um, Mindanao, I think this level of diplomacy as well needs to be pushed forward, right? And, you know, the military to military side of things, the peace building aspect um, of, uh, you know, Malaysia's foreign policy, this is what needs to come to the forefront. So it's not a simple thing um, with this context. I think the Malaysian government needs to see it as a comprehensive problem. We need to be able to um, draw on our resources and mobilize our expertise on peace building we have to mobilize our uh, regional diplomacy skills when it comes to convening uh, the region to find a regional solution, including for the boats. Let's say we don't take uh, any more, but we want to see responsibility shared. So how do we do that across the region? We can play that leadership role in convening, even if we're not the ones uh, accepting. So I'll end there, um, and I'd really like to hear views and uh, take this discussion further. Thank you so much. It is kindly requested that a participant who wish to forward your questions are required to introduce yourself by stating your name and your institution that you are from and put over your question briefly. Uh, can we have a first question please? Sir? Yes, sir. Okay, good morning, sir, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mohamed Faisal bin Ismail from uh, Malaysian Armed Forces Quarters, Operation and Training uh, Division. So, uh, before I proceed with the question, I just uh, to clarify uh, 
First, uh, can you uh, provide us uh, briefly on, uh, about, call it, uh, uh, I have difficulty to pronounce, Jitiak Foundation. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and uh, also, in the uh, first uh, statement, there's now that uh, we have uh, difficulties on to identify the boats at the uh, uh, sea maritime area. So, uh, at the current situation, I think uh, Malaysian Armed Forces have no difficulties on that for me. Uh, uh, because uh, we have uh, four dimension of uh, capability to identify that uh, maritime area. Especially now on the uh, post-COVID uh, pandemics, we enhance our operation at the maritime and also the land. And also, uh, Rohingya is uh, which uh, citizen they are at uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, or so on. And uh, what is uh, actually uh, the embassy here uh, in the Bangladeshi or Myanmar uh, respond on the situation. This uh, preparation and also uh, question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, so, firstly, to give a little bit of background on uh, Gatanio, Gatanio Foundation, uh, we are actually um, a humanitarian organization, but we also function as a, a kind of quiet advisory center for, I mean, we, we don't do a lot of um, public publications or press statements or anything like that, but we do give a lot of advice uh, to governments and also to uh, organizations as well with some humanitarian expertise. So on the ground, we have a few programs and we have a humanitarian program, which, uh, for example, currently in Aceh, uh, because we have, uh, we're registered in two countries, in Indonesia as well as here in Malaysia. In uh, Aceh, the focus actually started with disaster response. So it was really response to natural disasters, training um, young Achenese uh, youth students in how to support disaster response because they face so many disasters. So it was really looking at building humanitarian capacity and having that humanitarian capacity support the local governments. So we work very closely with uh, the provincial government and the local um, district governments, the Kabupaten governments, uh, Aceh Utara, Aceh Timur, uh, Biren, and uh, Langsa, in particular the east coast of Aceh. Um, so then of course whenever boats start arriving in uh, Aceh, we become part of the response, mainly supporting coordination for the uh, local government. So we support them, basically we have somebody in sitting in the local government to help their coordination function. Um, and then we provide a bit of uh, direct air aid as well, where there's a gap. We're not a big organization, we're quite small. So we prefer to play the role of facilitator and um, giving advisory services. Uh, here in Malaysia, we also work um, mainly with refugees. And our, our focus, again, has been advisory. We've, we've provided uh, a lot of advice um, to the government, uh, particularly last uh, two years, uh, under the last administration, we were um, advising uh, very closely a couple of the ministries, including the foreign ministry, including MINDEF as well. Um, and a lot of our work is on that side is very confidential. So we provide private briefings, you know, basically um, talking points if uh, there's any of the ministers who need talking points uh, on these issues. Uh, but we also have a program which is a community-based program, uh, and we focus a lot on women. Um, and children on these programs. So we've been having, uh, as we, as I stated just now, the importance of language. We've been doing language classes for Rohingya refugees and for um, Afghan refugees also, Afghan women. Um, and that's been a big focus of our work because we really feel that, uh, specifically for the women, they're the least likely to have access to education. Um, and they're the most likely to have um, a need to go to hospital to take care of not only themselves but their families um, and they're the ones who we see have a lot of problems um, you know at the hospitals and we're very lucky here in Malaysia because one of the things that Malaysia has done very well is allow access to public hospitals for refugees we don't deny uh, refugees access to hospitals 
regardless of the immigration status, regardless of this, um, the only thing is they have to pay the foreigners' rate, which of course is too high for most refugees if they if they're not allowed to, uh, to work. So that's been our, our the programs that we've had here. During the MCO, we've been extremely busy. We've been giving a lot of food um, to lots of communities, not only refugees, also to um, B40 uh, across the country. Uh, identifying uh, the boats, I agree uh, but, uh, with Lieutenant Colonel, um, but I was actually trying to mention not about identifying the boat itself, because I'm sure uh, our Defence Force has extremely capable um, you know, capacities for that, but it's more about who the people on the boat are. So what is the origin of the people? Because when you see the boat, of course you don't have access immediately to interviewing them, also the language barriers, um, and also the methodology of interviewing so that we can really identify. It's not just what they say, but there's you know ways of, of uh, interviewing that you can really determine uh, who, who, where somebody's from. Um, so that's what I was mentioning, that uh, you know because we don't have our own asylum system, we don't have um, people in the government yet who are trained to do specifically identification of asylum seekers. Uh, that's still something which UNHCR provides uh, uh, capacity for. Hopefully one day Malaysia will develop our own capacity for uh, this kind of identification, but we're not, not quite there yet, so maybe in the coming years. Um, and then the last question was about the Rohingya, so the uh, citizenship. The Rohingya, unfortunately, are not citizens of any country. And that is the, actually the root cause of the problem for the Rohingya. Um, the reason why uh, the Rohingya are as vulnerable as they are now is because they have been denied citizenship in Myanmar since 1982. So in 1982, um, there was a new citizenship law that was uh, issued in Myanmar. And under this law, they basically listed 135 uh, ethnic groups who were eligible to become citizens or to be recognized as citizens. And that list did not include the Rohingya, which is why now the Rohingya have literally become uh, stateless. So what they, we call them de facto stateless. They, they don't like the term stateless because they all you know, really claim that they, are, they have the right to, to citizenship in Myanmar. But the, the problem is that um, most of them don't have the documentation, and there there is there is some there are some small pathways for them to apply for nationality, but it's so difficult for Rohingya to prove and to have all the documents. So the requirements are very uh, difficult for them to meet, and they also can't call themselves Rohingya because Rohingya is not identified on the list. Um, they can identify as another group, but not as uh, Rohingya. So this is a big, uh, that's actually the main problem. So because of that, no access to education. Because of that, no access to livelihoods. Because of that, no access uh, to um, actually even freedom of movement. No access to proper health care. All of those problems started because of the lack of, of citizenship. Um, so therefore, unfortunately, neither embassy takes responsibility for them. Yeah. Can we have a uh, next question, please? Hey, ma uh, my name is Captain Sarawan. I'm the director of Maritime Security in Midas. Here I have three short questions. First of all, who are the Arakan soldiers? Are they, uh, are they are the, the Rohingyas or the freedom fighters of Rohingyas? First one. Second one, is there any other Muslim, uh, I would say, uh, 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 race in Myanmar that live peacefully among the, the Myanmaris? And third thing is that, why does the current uh, Rohingya people do not want to go and live in the new island that been developed by Bangladesh? Thank you. Excellent question, Captain. Uh, so the first question is on the Arakan army. Uh, the, I, mean, one could, I could give a whole lecture just on the Arakan army, but it would take uh, you know, um, a long time. The Arakan army is, uh, they're not Rohingya, they're Rakhine. Rakhine is an ethnic group. So if you see Rakhine state, which is where the Rohingya are from, it's a very large state uh, which is comprised of several ethnic groups. And the biggest ethnic group there is the Rakhine. They're mainly Buddhist, I would say 99% Buddhist. Um, then you have the Rohingya who are not recognized, but they're a large minority. And then you have the Kaman, that is a Muslim minority also, smaller group. Um, and then you have a few other you know, mi minorities um, as well. Uh, but the 
Arakan army was founded by a group of uh, Rakhine, Rakhine Buddhist youth. And it has an interesting history because it didn't start in Rakhine itself. Uh, you know, on the other side of the border, near China, uh, in Thailand you have Kachin State. So Kachin State is another state in Myanmar which has been affected for many years by conflict. And they have a very strong um, uh, armed uh, movement as well, the uh, Kachin Independence uh, Organization, KIO. KIO uh, has been one of the strongest um, we, can we call it rebel groups, right, in, in Myanmar. Not asking for independence, they, none of them are. They're all asking for um, autonomy, confederation, you know, their own kind of uh, self-governance uh, within, within Myanmar. Um, but the KIO has a reputation for being one of the best trained rebel groups militarily. Um, and the Arakan army started as a group of Rakhine who joined the Kachin and there was a group of youth, they're very educated, they're extremely different from the Rohingya. So this is why you can actually see that the Myanmar military is actually facing quite a difficult uh, challenge, you know, with uh, this battle, because these are educated, very sophisticated insurgency. Um, and again, they're not asking for independence, they don't want an independent Rakhine, it's not like uh, Aceh in those days, but it's more like, um, they, they want self-government, they want autonomy, they want to renegotiate uh, the terms of resources. So it is an insurgency movement, uh, not separatism, but for for um, autonomy. Uh, they're very strong now, and they're, they've increased in strength rapidly. And only a few years ago, um, 2016 to 2017, the group of youth who started it, it started just with about 25 youth in uh, Kachin State, and then they had a plan to return to Rakhine State, and they returned through Chin State. So now Chin State is also still a bit unstable in the south because of this conflict, because the fighting is mainly in northern Rakhine and southern Chin State. Um, the Arakan army has now spread, and it's moving further south, so every time, you know, if you look at the battles, I mean, I, I get all this information about the battles these days, you know, and you can actually see the movement is going further south. So every time there's like the attacks that take place now um, against the Myanmar military would be further and further south. So their um, aim currently is to basically capture Rakhine State uh, and hold a territory. That's what their uh, mission is currently, um, and and this is why this conflict is not uh, is not ending. Uh, the Myanmar Muslim community. That's another very interesting question. So the, there are Myanmar Muslims who are citizens. Um, it's not an easy relationship as well. Uh, so I would say, you know, if you go to Yangon, and recently my colleague Omar and I, we went to Yangon, and you go to Yangon and you don't really feel, um, you don't feel discrimination. Uh, but if you go to other places outside, you may not feel it so directly, but if you read Burmese and you understand the history of what's been happening, there's been a progressive movement uh, to take to diminish the rights of Muslims in Myanmar. So I wouldn't say that they're facing the same kind of level of discrimination at all. It's not genocide against uh, Myanmar Muslims, but there is, even towards citizens, uh, and we can't generalize it totally because it's not the same in every location, but in many parts of Myanmar, especially where you have this particular movement, which is called um, 969. There's this 969 movement, which they claim to be a Buddhist movement, but it's actually a very political movement. And again, it's it's you know not to blame this problem on Buddhism because it's obviously not part of Buddhist uh, beliefs to hold this kind of um, discrimination. But the reality is that Buddhism, in this case, has been used as a way to mobilize uh, Islamophobic sentiment against any Muslim in Myanmar, and there have been a lot of you know, rumors that have been spread about Muslims do this and Muslims do that, and it was actually very bad a few years ago. It's improved a little bit now. Um, but the Myanmar Muslim population in many parts of Myanmar has faced um, a lot of incidents because of this sentiment. So there, there were um, times when we could actually track, and in fact there's, um, there are some organizations who've been tracking the number of incidents and the number of uh, villages, for example, that you know were suddenly putting up signs saying um, "Muslim-free villages," 
right? And this was not something normal in Myanmar. In Myanmar, you have a lot of different ethnic groups, a lot of different religions. You have a big Christian population, um, you know, of many denominations. You have, uh, we even had actually a Jewish population at one point in Myanmar. It was very cosmopolitan. Uh, but progressively, um, there's been, uh, because of this, uh, this Islamophobic um, campaign that was taking place, there was the appearance of all kinds of um, very unfriendly, uh, I would say local orders or local um, initiatives. So that one was Muslim free villages, they didn't want Muslims to stay in the village. Another thing was renting, renting your property. So renting your property or your business, suddenly there were these notices going around, you know, people shouldn't be renting uh, their premises to a Muslim. And there were people who didn't agree with it, but they were quite frightened to speak up against it. So it's quite a complicated issue. I would say it's not um, a place that is where freedom of religion is really respected. Um, and the Muslim uh, community in particular is, is vulnerable as well, which is also another reason why you have a lot of Myanmar Muslims here. And most of them don't have UNHCR cards, but they also don't feel safe in Myanmar. So that's uh, important. Bashan Shah. So why do the Rohingya not want to go to Bashan Shah? It's because that most of the Rohingya actually want to go back to um, Myanmar. And they feel that going to Bashan Shah would mean being trapped in Bangladesh. So that's one of the main reasons why they actually prefer to stay in the border. The conditions might be better in Bashan Shah. And actually many Bangladeshis are saying, why aren't they going to Bashan Shah? We would like to go to Bashan Shah because it's better than where we live. So you actually have a situation now where some Bangladeshis are putting up their hands and saying, please take us because we'd rather go there. But unfortunately for the Rohingya, they, they they really base um, a lot of their decisions about what they do to, according to the ability to one day go back. And, you know, Bashan Shah was started actually as, um, it was being constructed to be a naval base. So, you know, the infrastructure is good actually. Um, but I think the isolation, I think, you know, for a Navy it's fine with all the infrastructure and all of the capacity, um, but for Rohingya without um, the means, you know, to travel, I think that fear of being cut off and also, you know, not having networks, not having any of this in, on the border of Cox's Bazar in uh, Myanmar, even though now the Bangladesh government has uh, cut off or reduced the internet um, in the camps, many of them can still get the line from Myanmar. So there's still means of communication and that's really important to them. Um, so I would say that that's one of the biggest reasons. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, Lillian, uh, I like your point about uh, I, I like your point about bringing the region into the subject, uh, obviously. But uh, wouldn't what do you think of? Well, this is a big question actually about the the refugee convention, you know. Well, it's, it has been something that we we dodge from, you know, <laughs> from this discussion. So, for 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 us, should we need to champion this regionally? Uh, will signing of the convention would have a positive implication to that, or or will it will it make it worse? You know, uh, that's that's one thing. And and the other thing is. Uh, I do have a, a very, a rather skeptical view to that because uh, at one time, uh, I probably quote my experience uh, back then when we sent troops to Afghanistan, you know. Uh, we, at the international stage, uh, prior to that, we, we seldom get the chance to, in fact, you know, register what, what we think of what's going on in, in Afghan, you know. Uh, but once we participated, <laughs> uh, well, it, it, there, there was quite a uh, diplomatic row involved, you know, and, and some, some don't agree in the government, but some did, do, did. So we eventually sent a troop there. And, and what he has is altered too is that we are more welcome at the international stage to, to, you know, to basically share your voice there. 
So, you know, this is something that we need to, to probably make a huge leap here. You know? On one angle, you, you're very reserved, especially on that convention. And then the other, on, on the other hand, <laughs> you'd like to champion it, you know, uh, and, and giving at least the minimal international support to, to the plight of the Rohingya. So can you comment that a little bit? Thank you. It's really great points, <laughs> I think it's an extremely, uh, I mean, it's, it's not an easy uh, position to navigate. I think for Malaysia, but I would say that, I mean, you know, having looked at this problem for such a long time, I think we would lose a lot um, if Malaysia would, you know, somehow let go of this problem. Right? We've we've really been the champion in the region and even globally, even globally. So I think we need to recognise that Malaysia has a legacy of speaking out not only on this problem on other problems like Palestine as well, but this has been one of the main issues and uh, Malaysia is recognized to be one of the main champions of this problem. So I think that we need to think about what we're willing to do um, internally as a country domestically and what we're willing to do outside on this problem. And there again, I think we do need to have, you know, a, a comprehensive kind of policy and strategy on this, which includes looking at how far we're willing to go uh, to extend some level of rights to refugees who are here in the country, um, improve the management, as I said just now, managing the populations better, which I'm always an advocate for more policy, not only because it's better for refugees, but it's better for us. It's much better for us. And I, I think, you know, I wasn't surprised at all that there were all these issues that were popping up in Salayang and all these places because we haven't had a policy. So those are all areas which we should be regulating, but we should have done it a long time ago. We should have done it when, you know, we decided, I mean, Malaysia has been actually quite good to um, refugees on an ad hoc basis. So for many years, you know, we've extended uh, protection to uh, Bosnians, to Achenese, to, to the Cham even before that, you know, to the into Chinese um, but people. It's actually not the first time that we've been uh, quite generous towards refugees, but it's always been on an ad hoc basis without a proper policy. And it really is time that we develop a policy. And a policy doesn't mean that, you know, once we have a policy on refugees, it means that we basically have an open door to anyone. No, it actually means the opposite. It actually means that precisely because we have a policy, we know who needs protection and who is not a priority for protection, right? Because there are mechanisms to do that. There are ways that you can, um, and also we can set our quotas, right? I mean, you look at some countries who've signed the Refugee Convention, Japan, Korea, they've signed the convention. They don't have tons of refugees flying there, you know, or applying because they're acceptance rate is so low and they make it so difficult to become a refugee in those countries that in fact I remember three years ago I was there um, giving lectures uh, at universities for about two weeks um, to parliament and universities about um, refugees and I had a long meeting with the Japanese immigration that they were asking me about Myanmar and about the region and their rate of recognition of refugees was like 23 a year they signed the convention you know, they are upholding international standards, but they've made it so difficult to become a refugee in Japan that they don't have this fear of opening the floodgates, you know, lots of people coming. There are a few Rohingya there, but it's tiny. It's a really small group. You know, so Malaysia can control the population of refugees and the arrivals actually with policy. So that, to me, I think would be one of the best ways of ensuring that we are um, both meeting uh, you know, a humanitarian obligation, ensuring that we have a, a platform, as you said, uh, Tuan, to be able to speak uh, about the root causes at a diplomatic level, regionally and internationally, it gives us the credibility, um, but also it helps us to regulate. And because we have a legal pathway, 
it will also start to stop the boats from coming because and then we will have every justification to then say we have extremely strict borders we don't allow we have zero tolerance on the borders because we have a legal pathway if you find a way to get here you know you apply through the system and if there's a boat that comes you you know you can then find a way to keep them in a certain area and if they don't uh, you know, if they actually don't meet the criteria, then we need to make decisions about what to do with those people who fail that requirement. So there are lots of things that we can do, and I would be an advocate. I would say not only the convention, I mean, the convention itself is quite a high threshold, um, but domestic policy, right? Domestic policy that's in the spirit of the convention, we could design that, and then eventually get to the point where we look at signing the convention, which wouldn't be a big challenge anymore. But I think what we really need is domestic policy. I would like to relate the question that being asked by Captain Sarah just now with regards to the Shah, Shah Bazar the Fuji Islands. You mentioned about um, most of the Rohingya doesn't want to go to that island because they doesn't want to be stranded there. But what about those who are stranded in Malaysia? Because um, they also doesn't want to go back to um, Myanmar. If you ask them, okay, I'm asking on behalf of uh, NGOs, uh, responsibility and roles. What NGO roles in with regards of persuading all the Rohingyas to go to the refugee island? You mentioned about they are having a lack of education, lack of facilities and everything. In Shah Bazar, they provide everything. Why don't they go there, build up their nation, and fight for their right? This is a long-term planning. So what is the NGO uh, roles and tasks uh, in, I mean, with regards to this issue? Because I've heard, I mean, I've uh, listened to the Foreign Minister of Bangladesh mention about this issue, which they are very firm to move all the Rohingyas to the island. And also we heard uh, there are lots of documentation with regards to the opinion by the Rohingya themselves, but we doesn't listen anything from the NGOs. And then the second question, with regards of NGOs, lately because of the Rohingya issues, the atmosphere in Malaysia towards the Rohingya and NGOs is a not a very good condition, if I can say a negative condition. It seems like the NGOs here are championing the humanitarian issues, rather concerned about our defense and security issues. We know that most of the Rohingyas who are coming here is related to human trafficking. And the, the NGOs are supporting them. Are you saying that... Uh, the NGO is supporting the uh, the uh, human trafficking trafficking issues compared uh, uh, to our security issues. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. We have ex extremely important issues. It's very um, it's hard for uh, NGOs, certainly in Malaysia, to talk about Bashan Shah because most of them don't know what's happening in Bangladesh. I would say that there's a big disconnect. You know, in countries like Bangladesh and Myanmar, there are a lot of international NGOs, right, and a lot of international um, agencies. Most of the NGOs working here in Malaysia are only working here in Malaysia. And if I can say, I mean, from I, I think we're one of the few NGOs that has a regional perspective on these issues, and we also do research, you know, so we actually study these issues in depth. Most of the humanitarian NGOs here working with... Um, uh, refugees in general, but definitely even those working with the Rohingya, very few actually have an understanding of what's happening in Myanmar or, or in Bangladesh. I would say one of the exceptions is Mapim. Mapim understands what's happening because they also work in um, Bangladesh and they work in Myanmar uh, as well. And of course, President Chegu Azmi has been a big uh, advocate. I think that there is a role um, but again, it won't be general. It, it should be, you know, the NGOs which know the context, um, so it could be like Mapim, ourselves, maybe a handful of others, who could be engaged, uh, you know, to sit with the government and strategize about how the communication can be done towards Rohingya. And I think that kind of approach is better because I think we can't expect most of the NGOs here, and again, it's Chatham House rules, but you know, certainly in, in our experience, I'm, I'm sometimes shocked at the lack of knowledge by uh, you know, colleagues in the NGO sector about the context of a, a crisis. They don't actually understand the background. 
you know, they see sometimes the conditions of people living here, they see the needs, and that's what they're trained to do. But very few um, organizations, you know, invest in having a deeper understanding about even defense issues. And, and I agree with you, you know, it, it's such a complex issue. This issue of smuggling and trafficking is very serious, and there are lots of implications. So we do have to make sure that we're not doing things to encourage that as well. Um, but I think that, you know, this is maybe another um, initiative that could be done is to actually invite a few of the organizations who are working with uh, Rohingya refugees to actually have a dialogue, you know, to say, these are the concerns that um, the government has. This is, you know, what NGOs are, uh, ask the NGOs what their role is, and then come up with a kind of a strategy. And, and in fact, I think that the Malaysian government has every right to really ask for much more coordination and transparency, you know, from the NGOs who are working uh, with um, the Rohingya and also other populations, because there, there really has to be collaboration, right? This is not um, a situation that anybody should be working on alone. It's a situation where the approach and the response is so complex, the, the problem is so complex, we all need to work together and to learn from each other about um, approaches that we take. Um, yeah, this issue about Bashan Chao uh, as well, I think um, it's true that I think logically, if it was any of us making the decision, we would say it makes a lot more sense to be in Bashan Chao than where you have, um, you know, the government is offering a lot more resources, even livelihoods and education and all of those things, uh, as you said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. But as an anthropologist, I think one of the most difficult things to understand is human behavior and human, um, you know, of a society and community. Sometimes we don't really know what the motivations are and something that might be logical to us, um, to a group like the Rohingya, you know, could, they could still be very afraid of it. And I think partly there's really this fear, you know, they, they don't like being refugees, to be honest, you know, they especially those who are in Bangladesh right now, there's, there's, still, there's still a lack of acceptance that they are refugees and that they're not going home. So they're really waiting, waiting and waiting and waiting to see the situation improve in Myanmar. And I think that partly this onward movement for them is precisely because they see the situation getting so much worse. Um, and there's, this, there's desperation. And there's a fear um, that they have to be sent back under those conditions. Uh, any more question? Oh, one. The last question. Okay. Last two questions. <laughs> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm actually happy. Uh, I believe you have done your great uh, research. You did uh, inform us about uh, many uh, useful information about Rohingya issues. But I'd like to uh, voice out two issues here. One, I think uh, we need to define the status of the Rohingyas coming into Malaysia, especially those uh, from uh, Kobaza, where uh, from the first boat uh, until this, uh, this year, out of 202, the total uh, Rohingyas on one boat, uh, I think 131, which uh, they have already have Bangladesh uh, UNESCO cards, right? So that means to, to say that uh, UN already uh, recognized yes, refugee status in Bangladesh. But uh, when they come over to Malaysia, are we going to recognize the again of their refugee status? Or did this economic migrant? So, uh, and then the way they're coming in is through illegal way. So I think uh, we should... Uh, Hello. Sorry. So I think uh, we should uh, put forward uh, this issue. Hello, hello. It's okay now. Okay. So, hello. Uh, sorry. Technical mistake. It's okay. Uh, I think we should uh, put forward uh, this issue internationally so that uh, for other uh, countries to understand actually we are we are not uh, really uh, that uh, I mean uh, push them away but the thing is that uh, we to consider their entry 
is illegal, firstly. Secondly, they are not refugees anymore at the time of point that when they enter to, to Malaysia. So this is the first one. Secondly, uh, I think uh, the international uh, cooperation, as you said that, uh, earlier, I think uh, we have to beef up the uh, yeah the cooperation between ASEAN, not only ASEAN, maybe uh, uh, with every country like Australia, US, even Europe. Whereby, if you can see that the statistic uh, raised by UNHCR, our refugees uh, total, I mean, coming to Malaysia, has grown up uh, tremendously from uh, 1990 until now, in 10 years' time. From 3,000 until now, it's almost 180,000. So, largely, it's from uh, Myanmar. Then, if you can see that uh, reputation or third country except the refugees in Malaysia is only 1,000 over to 2,000 a year. So that means to say that it's compared to the current figure, it's less than 0.02%. So that means to say 99.8% is still remain in Malaysia. So until how long they were in Malaysia before accepting or accepted by the third country? And then those countries uh, has uh, voiced out that Malaysia should assist them, assist the refugees in Malaysia. But what they have role play by them? They are the secretary as compared to Malaysia. We are not the member state of the uh, Refugee Convention. Even the protocol of relating to uh, refugee status, 1967. So I think uh, this issue has to be brought out uh, maybe by our government or by any NGOs to highlight it uh, and to give some pressure for the advanced country to uh, expedite in terms of accepting them uh, in more in years to come. If not, we will end up with all the problem with us and then we can't get any help from a neighboring country. Okay, thank you. Right, yeah. Good morning to all, to Ms. Elian and to all. My name is Dr. Jessica Ong from National Defence University of Malaysia. I'm glad to ask about the role of uh, social media and media nowadays yeah, towards this problem, especially you know, the violent tracks and also the anti Rohingya campaign in Malaysia. Nowadays, you know what happened, right? So with the petitions and uh, with all the hate speech, you know. So how that maybe NGOs can work together with social media or media as a medium, the best medium communication to make sure that this uh, the best uh, way forward for the Rohingya issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, these last uh, questions. Um, maybe I'll ask, uh, uh, can, if I may answer Dr. Jessica's question first, because it's uh, perhaps a bit more of a straightforward uh, answer. Um, for this anti-Rohingya uh, campaign, um, I think it was very unfortunate that it got to that level. Um, and I, I do think that NGOs have been very disturbed by what's been happening. Um, so th there's two things. I mean, I think one thing is that most NGOs didn't want to engage. I mean, there's, some of them did. Some of them spoke out and issued statements and others. Organizations like ours kept very quiet because for us, the priority is being able to continue to do our work. I mean, we don't like to get involved in, uh, you know, public controversies in that sense. And also, that's part of our principle as um, our understanding and our interpretation of humanitarian principles is that we remain neutral and we remain uh, impartial and independent in our conduct no matter what. So we try our best not to engage in controversies precisely so that we can continue to have access to support um, the most vulnerable people. So that, in a sense, is for some organizations who are uh, abiding to international humanitarian principles um, as set out by the Red Cross and Red Crescent, that's the approach that we take. So you, you won't see the Red Crescent making statements about this, for example. The same with our organization. We wouldn't speak out against it, although we do a lot of work behind the scenes. So we were helping um, to try to track you know, how many uh, incidents might have taken place in the communities, uh, were there incidents uh, that were it, um, incited by this campaign. There was a couple of incidents that we noted that 
um, there were uh, Rohingya refugees who had their cards torn up or taken, you know, arguments that started. So things at the community level. So we monitor at that level. Um, there were other organizations, more of the human rights organizations, I think less humanitarian, more human rights organizations who would speak up uh, more vocally and more publicly against it. But I do think there is a role for social media. However, I think that the climate, because the climate was so hostile towards the Rohingya, most of the Rohingya basically decided to just keep their heads down and as low as possible. A few Rohingya organizations made statements to clarify because there was... Um, I think there's, there's two things. I mean, one is there was certain things that were being said in the campaign that were, you know, very obviously false. There was a lot of fake news that was being spread. There were claims, uh, you know, that um, there was one Rohingya activist who was asking for Malaysian citizenship. All of that was untrue, but it didn't actually matter anymore whether, whether it was true or not because it was circulating so widely that the sentiment started to become, you know, very panas, right? The second thing is that there are some issues, as I stated earlier, where there is some truth to the issues that were being raised. And I think that for some of those issues, like the whole issue about the Salayang market, you know, it's been very poorly managed. So that's been an issue that's been simmering for years, below the surface, you know, and then Mambara, 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 suddenly Malato, you know, so it's been that kind of situation for a lot of these incidents. So in that case, I felt like there's a reason why these things are being said. Then the issue is, how do we have a more civilized dialogue about it? How do we get mobilize the stakeholders, mobilize, you know, the local representative, the Majlis for Bandaran Salayang, all the different stakeholders to sit and sort out a DBKL, for example, as well, which is in charge of the Pasaporo. How do you sit together and design solutions and options for these problems? How do you manage them? So it becomes more of a crisis management issue. Um, there has been some discussion amongst uh, some NGOs to try to highlight more positive contributions uh, by refugees and try to shift. But I think that the conversation needs to change because honestly I think that now we're at the stage in Malaysia where it shouldn't be just about Oh, Rohingya Kasihan, you know, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about rights and obligations. And I think for this dialogue, we have to stress more the obligations now, precisely because we have to take into consideration all these sentiments uh, that our local population has, which has not been voiced out for a long time. So for us, one of the things that we're doing to respond to this is we, are, we have a program this year where we are working with the state governments and the municipal governments at the local level to really try to facilitate dialogue on these issues. And dialogue means you have a safe space to say things which might be uncomfortable with each other. And you, but the objective is so that you build trust and you build a mechanism so that you can work through problems together. So Joho, uh, Kelantan, Kuda. Kuda is actually a very good example because you have the presence of strong organizations such as MAPIM. You have uh, some Rohingya refugees, not the new arrivals, but the ones who've been there for a long time, who speak excellent Bahasa. They're more integrated in the Malay community than some of them don't even speak Rohingya anymore. So you have a population that understands and is able to have dialogue with each other. So in that kind of situation, you know, this is what we want um, to see. How do they resolve problems? If there's a misunderstanding, there will always be misunderstanding in any society. How do you bring the different sides together to have um, more understanding at the community level, dispute resolution, so that you don't allow tensions to rise? So that's the kind of thing that we'll be doing this year. Um, this, this more complicated um, set of questions <laughs> that was raised. Um, so this question about whether uh, this group of refugees who are coming from Bangladesh, if they have already received refugee status in Bangladesh, when they come to Malaysia, do they need to receive again the refugee card? It's not about receiving a double status, it's about um, a continuation of uh, a status of refugees which deserves international protection. So it's. I think we need to understand that because Bangladesh is not signatory to the refugee convention, Bangladesh is not issuing their own um, status of asylum 
and refugee recognition to the Rohingya, which is why they have UNHCR cards. With a UNHCR card, it means that the country itself does not have a national asylum system. So if they were to go to Japan, for example, it would be a different story. If there was a boat that landed in Japan or Korea and um, they were all accepted, let's say hypothetically, and they received from the Japanese government or the Korean government recognition of refugee status, those countries are signatory to the convention, they have national asylum systems. If then those refugees decided to come to Malaysia and they applied you know, for asylum here, or we don't have a national asylum system, they would not be recognized by UNHCR as refugees and they wouldn't have the right to apply for a refugee card because they already have you know, internationally recognized um, uh, refugee protection under the convention. So Bangladesh is a different story because they haven't signed the convention. Um, they are hosting a lot of refugees, but having a UNHCR card from Bangladesh is not from the Bangladesh government. And therefore, when I think our government has suggested to Bangladesh and um, has uh, perhaps requested whether Bangladesh would be willing to readmit some of the uh, Rohingya who were on the boats, Bangladesh has said no. And the reason for that is because Bangladesh doesn't feel they have an obligation to protect these people. And that's Bangladesh's choice. I think they also feel they've really been playing uh, an enormous role out of their own goodwill. So it's also not fair in Bangladesh, I would say. It doesn't mean that uh, you know our only option is to just accept everyone. And this is why what I stated earlier was what we should be doing is to be clever regionally and diplomatically. If Malaysia wants to take the position that we really don't take any more boats right now, okay, it's a fair position to take. But then we need to be able to say, to accompany that with a statement to say, we don't take boats, but we seek regional solutions. And the way we seek regional solutions is to convene um, emergency dialogue, I would say. It has to be emergency because there are still people out at sea. So I think that Malaysia needs to think about, you know, the way we are being understood and our concerns are being perceived. We don't want, um, you know, internationally, the wrong perception about what our concerns are. It's not that we don't care that there are people at sea, but we also care about our uh, borders and our limitations to be able to grant um, assistance to these people. So therefore, it's the responsible thing to do then is to say internationally or regionally, we are at our limit, we can't take any more. We would like to focus on managing um, the COVID situation and even on the refugee situation within our country with the population that is already in our country. We would like to ask the international community and ask the region to help to facilitate other arrangements that can help to protect these people. We can't do it. And that's a responsible statement to make if our government really feels that we are not able to take it anymore, which is a fair statement. Um, but then what, what else can we do? Um, we can seek regional solutions. We can seek regional arrangements. We should be demanding, I would say, much more commitment from the international community, not just UNHCR, but the international donors. If um, Southeast Asia, if the ASEAN region is expected to help with disembarkation, the international donors should be ready to bring money to the table. You know, if there's going to be a temporary disembarkation point, so I suggested Aceh just now, but the Aceh government can't obviously pay for it. And Jakarta also will have difficulties paying for it. So where's that dialogue, you know, internationally bringing the donors together? We could, as Malaysia, facilitate that if we had that will. Um, and that would actually be, for me, I think a good solution because it would still say we're committed to the issue it would say we seek the solutions, but we are being honest about the fact that we can't take any more, but we want to uh, convene these discussions and we want to ensure that we are finding solutions in the region. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to share with you, uh, last two years I also on board ship uh, to catch and to investigate Rohingya boat. And 
uh, last last four years and then last, last two years I used to work with uh, voluntary to teach uh, Rohingya children so there's two different uh, experience so another <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there is two different here. This is the platform. We have uh, a different uh, experience, but the, this is the platform where we have to share the experience and what the meeting point, the community where we can achieve to not I say to solve the problem, but to have the appropriate way to settle this uh, issue. I think.